Hello everybody. I'd like to just briefly summarize uh, my lectures, my three lectures for the summer school. Um, the first on consumption and uh, the problem of consumption his from a historical point of view, from a social point of view. And then the second one on waste and then the third one on the circular economy. So these will be about 10 minutes each and I've also provided a few more uh, little talks uh, on different aspects of this so that you can replay these talks and perhaps uh, if your English is not so good you can slow them down and try and understand a bit better what I'm trying to say. So the first one on consumption Basically, um, our problem at the moment is that uh, we are producing things, more things, more efficiently than we've ever produced them before. And we are therefore encouraging people to throw away what they possess and buy the, the latest and the best, the, the new thing. Yeah? And this so-called hyper-consumption or accelerated consumption is producing a lot of waste um, and a lot of uh, pollution. For example, if we look at uh, mobile phone use, mobile phones were first produced, um, they lasted four to five years. A lot of people kept them much longer than they keep them now. Um, a break, uh, and a lot of people upgrade only after a year. So this is really unsustainable um, because, you know, we, we have to produce, uh, you know, around five billion of these things for users around the world. And if they're only going to last a year or so, this is tremendous drain on resources. It's a complex product. So where did all this start? Well, when we go back to uh, the Second World War, we can see that this became official economic policy. Um, we wanted to democratize the world in the West. We wanted to uh, make sure that people were fed properly, that they enjoyed a quality of life. And this meant we thought we should do this through producing more consumer goods. And so uh, this would, in, the idea was that I would make a fridge, you would make a washing machine, you would buy my fridge, I would buy your washing machine. And this would keep me in work and uh, keep you in work and by having these machines our quality of life would improve, our standard of life would improve. Um, and uh, the, the linear economy in a way is the result of this 40-50 years later. Um, so I looked at the history of this uh, uh, from the 30s in America to the 50s and how in the 50s this really took off. Um, partly as a result of the Cold War and competition with uh, the Russians um, and the need to kind of convince the world, uh, the free world or the world, the, the third world, that our way was the best way. And uh, so the politics was, uh, the politics came in to drive this um, push towards uh, a consumer society because you could keep people uh, engaged in um, and committed to the institutions of public life through consumption. Um, the only problem is that this created more pollution, more waste, and by the 70s this became a serious problem. Uh, you know, we were seeing more and more signs of environmental degradation, um, serious pollution, uh, uh, increasing mountains of waste, None of these things we had solutions for at the time. And science and technology, it was believed, would somehow solve our problems. So um, much of this was based on cheap oil. It's chemicals, fertilizers, pesticides, plastics were all produced in vast numbers cheaply so that more people could benefit from consumption and their living standards could rise. So far, so good. This, this is not a bad thing, but the trouble is we were making things in a way that uh, for consumption, but the end result was uh, not really understood. And how this works economically is very interesting. Basically, it means uh, increasing efficiencies in production, produce 
uh, more things more quickly, but this reduces the margins, the prices of things relative to incomes goes down. And the margins of the manufacturer also have reduced um, because the costs are reduced. And this, in effect, forces the manufacturer to produce more goods for more people faster. And this creates waste. Waste is a natural outcome of this uh, accelerating system of consumption. And what we find is that in each domain in everyday life, and we'll be looking uh, next, tomorrow I look at this in a little bit more detail, but you can see how in each domain, like say a car, uh, we find that uh, you know, consumption becomes um, trapped by big systems. And these big systems like the road system, we become dependent on our cars. We think we own them, and we think we have control, but the car ends up becoming the only way we can do the things we need to do. And the trouble is the car is contributing directly to climate change. And it becomes, because these systems become so powerful and so effective, it becomes very hard to change them, to uh, alter them over time. And these systems are in every area, food production, transport, communication, housing, uh, you know, they all have costs, environmental costs. So now we have to try and deal with the environmental costs of these systems. Um, and I go into, in this lecture, this first lecture, a bit of the history of this. I talk about uh, the background in Europe and how the new economy uh, with these large sort of technological systems gradually displaced the older, more local uh, more artisan, skill-based systems of the past. Um, and how design, in a sense, facilitated and enabled these systems to become dominant. Um, and plastics I talk about as being exemplary. That is the, a really good example of how the linear economy works. They're fast, they're cheap, they're very efficiently produced, and we can't stop producing them. They work very effectively within the particular domains and jobs we put them into. Packaging, uh, you know, in, in cars, all kinds of uh, mechanical and computerized devices now require lots of plastics. Um, so the problem with plastics is that they last, even when they're broken. So now, for example, when you you go into your garden, you dig, uh, say, um, a square meter of earth and you'll find plastic fragments. You go into the sea and uh, uh, you swim in the sea, you'll find that every square meter of sea, there's around, um, there's more plastic fragments than there are fish. Um, and uh, particular animals like whales, uh, albatrosses, because of the way they fish, the way they scoop the surface of the sea, they poison themselves with plastics. They kill themselves. They kill their babies with plastics, feeding them not only fish, this is the albatross, but also plastic fragments. So plastics has become this kind of environmental nightmare that we need to deal with. And the only way really to deal with it is to start dealing with it in the consumption phase, in the production phase, all the way through the system. And this requires rethinking what we're making, uh, what we're producing, and how we're dealing with it at the end of their, the life cycle. I call these products in my book, Somebody Else's Problem, post-cautionary products. Instead of precaution, and you probably, you know, in China, you probably have a very similar saying. The ancient Greeks had this saying, first do no harm. And doctors in the West, even today, they have to swear when they become a doctor that they will first do no harm to their patients. This is very important. I think every engineer needs to swear the same thing. First do no harm. Every scientist, first do no harm. This is precaution. Unfortunately, most of our products, how we design them, how we produce them, we don't. We have post-caution. We make them for a particular purpose and we ignore their side effects and the end results of what they will do in the environment.
So post-caution is a problem. We need to make sure that every product is now precautionary and this requires a revolution in design, in production, in engineering and in science. We have to have green science, no longer post-cautionary science from the past. So now that's probably all I need to say in this first talk.